how big data helps your China e-commerce strategy. Now this is Thoughtful. Hello, I'm Trevor Lai in Shanghai. China's e-commerce industry continues to grow, but it's a complex market with a few leading players like Alibaba and Yihao Dian and a growing number of niche vertical sites. Data is critical to success in China, but how do you take the science of data to get transactions online? Is the data from companies like Alibaba accurate and transparent? We'll find out this week on Thoughtful China from Jacob Cook, CEO of Web Presence in China. Jacob, thanks for joining us today. You're welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Let's start first with the definition and purpose of using big data in China, especially when it comes to e-commerce. Now, big data has been thrown around for years as a buzzword, but I suspect a very small percentage of people actually know what it means, or more importantly, how to apply it in their businesses. Well, sure. Uh, let's start with the term in general. Um, and that's kind of been one of the problems in people understanding how big is big, right? So I think what we've now evolved as an industry is in terms of data science um, and the art of data science. Um, Companies are able to use this now in a lot of different ways. And one of the advantages China has over, say, the West is the amount of third-party portals that conduct transactions and then leave the reports of those transactions live uh, for people to see. So what we can use applied data science here is to gather all those transactions data to record them um, and really analyze them to take a look at you know, uh, revenue projections, inventory projections, and these types of things to see what prices products are moving off the shelves, um, you know, so to speak, of these, uh, of these various platforms. Of course, that begs the question as well, though, how do you rely on the accuracy of that data? Well, in terms of receiving third-party data in China from the actual platforms, this is not really what I'm talking about here because we don't know. And actually, in, in truth, we, we've heard a lot of stories out recently about brushing and fake sales. And these are all included in revenue numbers, which of course will throw off your revenue projections if you're trying to see what the market size is. So what we do actually is we scrape the transaction records ourselves. Uh, we take a look at them. You know, this can be up to 500,000. You know, we can look at uh, Nike, Adidas, these types of brands. We can see how many small, medium, larges they're moving. You know, use that information to forecast inventory that we need to keep in the country, for example. We can then take a look at the transactions, see how many of those were discounted. Look at the pricing, you know, look at your manufacturing costs, and is China going to be an option for you? Are you going to be able to compete at the price points that people want products in market? And when you're talking about scraping, you're referring to programmatic scraping right. technology? That's correct, yes. And is that something that you guys developed, or is that an industry practice that you guys have sort of innovated on? Well, you know, it, it, technically it's not that hard. Now, uh, what gets to be a little bit of tricky is that these companies don't necessarily want you to be looking at that data. Um, Alibaba wants to put their revenue numbers out at, you know, exactly what, what they are. Um, so they can restrict IP addresses, they can do things like this, and that's where you need a little bit of ingenuity to be able to get um, what is essentially public information. Now, Forrester Research Report forecasted that China's e-commerce sales are set to hit one trillion U.S. dollars by 2019, largely fueled by mobile growth. Yeah. So when you're talking about these technologies and big data, does that apply to mobile as well? Absolutely it does. Um, you know, we're doing a lot of things with, with uh, data science in terms of analytics programs, um, investing in analytics companies, because we want to know what the actual landscape is here. Um, so we've got a couple of cool technologies that are measuring bandwidth. Um, these types of things. Now let's also look at that trillion dollar number. It is only for transactions. Okay, so if we actually look, including the B2B and the lead generation, where the actual physical transaction still may be a purchase order or a, a bank wire, this number is already well over a trillion dollars. It's probably 1.4 trillion dollars in terms of the transactions in China that are going on with some online component today. Well, one of the biggest questions when such big numbers and big data are thrown around is, is there still room for new players? Obviously the giants in China, Alibaba as you mentioned, Tencent, they all get the press and headlines. But for a smaller startup, they might be looking at how they could leverage data and some of the information analytics here to grow their business. Absolutely, they're doing it all the time. And that's another reason Alibaba doesn't want the data to get out there. But we see the rise now of so many third-party platforms in China, Mia Baobei in terms of the baby products, Jiuxian in terms of uh, wine and liquor sales. And these specialty uh, platforms are offering a far better experience um, to customers. Um, also, their buying power can be a lot better in terms, they might have price advantage even. So you talk about the giants, but if we look at the statistics, they're losing market share, you know, year after year. Their overall market's going up, the size of their transactions are going up, but these little guys are gaining on them uh, relatively quickly. So if we take those two different segments then, if you're an established big player, 
How do you react or use that data to be able to compete more nimbly with these smaller niche players? Well, um, you're going to want to find exam you want to find weaknesses, first of all. You want to look at transactions. You want to find out exactly what the customers are buying on there and what exactly what they're not buying on there. Then to look at your product. Look at your buying advantage. Where, where can you compete? You know? So Alibaba, you know, there's things that they don't do very well. They don't control their own shipping networks, like a Jingdong does, for example. Um, so there's areas. You know? uh, Mia Babe, when they look at, uh, in some markets, moving into controlling their own shipping, that's a great thing for them because parents are so concerned you know, about the safety of those products. So that's one thing that they've looked at and being able to look at um, store ratings on, on shipments and where people have complained and fix that. Now, I don't want to fixate entirely on e-commerce, yep. um, and you also just touched upon O2O. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about that a little bit. Can you give us an example of a physical retail chain or franchise that's been able to use data, maybe collected from some of the purchases online, but also mixed it and blended it with sales <laughs> transactions in stores? Well, I think Tesla has been a company that has uh, always been a big, big advocate of, uh, of data science, using it for its dealerships, using it for its charging stations, you know, where, where's the demand, where are the people going to be using these things, and they're fairly good about being able to predict that. Um, the other thing is, is we talked a little bit before was inventory projections, um, you know, being able to look at millions of transactions, you know, across the country and be able to know exactly, you know, the different sizes that retail outlets need to carry, different colors based on seasonality. And that saves a lot of money in terms of, you know, having a company shipping, you know, X millions of dollars of inventory into China. And if it goes unused, well, you pay your taxes on the imports. So you go through a lot of legal to get that back at the end of the day, assuming you want to ship it out of the country at that point. And then on the other end of the spectrum, if we're talking about smaller or emerging players, one of the biggest challenges for them is where to start. Yeah, let's take a look at this question from the point of view of uh, a product or service that wants to enter the market and is looking at this. So Alibaba, these numbers are huge from Forrester, but there's also been a lot of economists who have questioned the profits of these. You know, um, when we have such a degraded experience that we do on, on either Tmall, Taobao, Jingdong, um, it's hard for marketers to, to get the value add. You know, when we look at the technologies being used on standalone e-commerce stores like, like L'Oreal, for example, being able to try on makeup, you know, upload your picture, try the different shades, we're never going to be able to do that um, on these third-party platforms. Their, their software just isn't capable of it. And especially at that scale. So, yeah. so what you're saying is that if you're a smaller player in enterprise and you have a specialty, an area that you're truly strong in, you can leverage technology to kind of play that up as a differentiating point. Yeah, absolutely. Find out what, where people aren't, you know. Um, find out where the opportunities are and look at the transactions because the price point is the big thing. And if you can't compete at the price that the, your competitors are competing at here, well, we're going to save you millions of dollars, you know. Um, it's not right for everybody, you know. Um, we do know that. Now, when you look at the bigger transparency issues in China, obviously there are certain sites that we all know are blocked or very difficult to access here, and they have their sort of Chinese equivalents here. If there was a foreign company and they came to you and said, well, we'd like to try to expand our business to China, and we'd like to know how your analytics will be able to help us you know, land in China and start to scale in a smarter way, how would you advise them? Well, there's two things. If, if most of the people coming into the market in China, based on its uh, diversity and, the, and just the, the population densities that are, you know, what are we, 80 cities with more than a million people in the country, digital is, is almost always going to be your answer, you know, to coming in quickly. Then you're going to want to just take, uh, you know, you want to look at your competitors before you come in here, find out where they're not advertising, find out where they are, take a look at the traffic, where are your customers, where are they congregating, are they on social media, are they on bulletin boards. Um, Certain sectors, you know, like life sciences and diagnostics and medical are in China are booming. You know, it's an incredible opportunity for almost anybody. But if you want to look at retail clothing, for example, even though it's a large market, it's fairly saturated and it can be kind of tough to move into. So you need to look at that, um, you know, and not just sort of look at a one trillion dollar number necessarily and think, okay, well, that's it. I come here, I open up and I'm good. You know, I'm just going to get what I'm going to get. No, it's a very sophisticated consumer in China. Um, they look at a lot of things when making those purchasing decisions. And with the third-party platforms, it's really easy to compare your products and services to some other company. But with so many metrics, from your perspective, when you're advising your clients, how do you determine and what to filter out and what to focus on? Well, I think in terms of market entry, if you frame it that way, transactions are number one. We want to look at not just what you know, the industry release numbers are, but what are they transacting? You know, how much of those annual sales were 11-11 sales that were sold at a loss? How much of, of that? And what is the real price point? So it's not just about logging onto Tmall and see what the retail or the MSRP is here, but you know, what are they actually moving out the door at you know, in terms of coupons, promotions? That's a big one. I mean, people often underestimate that. Um, and the big, obviously, gray area making your job perhaps a little bit more difficult are counterfeits and fake products here. 
we're using data science a lot for counterfeits in the pharmaceuticals um, right now to detect fake drugs. Um, it is still rampant. So when we were looking at this before, you know, for Gucci and these guys, you know, you can get into trademark infringements and file claims, but you know, if Alibaba or, or Tencent or any of the bad are not going to deal with you, then you're kind of hamstrung because legal and, and, and you know, cyber crimes won't deal with it either. What we've noticed now is by targeting prescription drugs, where there's actually a human life component to it too, there's plenty of mechanisms in China. So you can find the phone numbers of people that are selling illegal drugs, you can have the phone numbers shut off, you can have them delisted from the search engine, you can have them kicked off of Alibaba. There's plenty of things we can do. And actually the laws in China are far more uh, protective in terms of the brand and the trademark holder than I find even in the US. So just to give you a real comparison between Google and Baidu here, in the West, Google does not take the liability for somebody selling a fake product using their advertising services, but in China, they do. So Baidu would be liable, theor in theory, for you know, a, a, a fake drug that got sold on them. So once you've notified them, for example, they take very quick action to remove that. And you've actually published reports about this in regards to Alibaba, for example. That's correct. And I have to say that they are, uh, you know, over, it's been difficult in those first couple of years, but as they built out and increased their capabilities, I've got to say, they've done a pretty good job working with us to take very quick action to the people that are, um, you know, affecting you know, fake sales and gray market. Well, I've heard Jack Ma say on more than one occasion, you know, that Alibaba is not a haven for counterfeit products. It's just a platform that allows you to find counterfeit products easier, and these existed in the marketplace. Well, I mean, that's the general, I wouldn't say COPPA, but it's similar to that. I mean, I just, you know, I, I just opened it up, but that hasn't held true. It didn't hold true with the Silk Road guys in the U.S. Um, absolutely, they have the capability to know exactly how many products are counterfeit on their platforms. Uh, there's very easy filters, you know, nobody is buying an Armani suit for 400 RMB off there. You know, we, we, these, the, the software that we have today could very easily detect this. Um, but of course, then there's a conflict of interest in terms of, you know. Well, the transactions, the numbers that they're reporting, et cetera. But you see this as a trend, a tightening up. If you well, will. they're complying. And, and I, I don't know if it's legal pressure that's also assisted in this, but the laws haven't changed. The laws prevent them from doing what they're doing. It's just a matter of it actually being enforced. And, and going through the new China that we're in now, um, you know, we're, we're entering, a, in, you know, the rule of law is becoming more prominent and, uh, and, and these are being enforced finally. Jacob, thanks for coming to our studio today. That wraps it up for today. Be sure to subscribe to us on Yoku, Tudo, and YouTube. You can also follow us on Weibo and Twitter and join our LinkedIn group. We'll see you again.